Welcome to another episode of Out There with Johnny. And today I'm going to talk about my lazy way of doing astrophotography. And by that, what I mean is I'm going to specifically work in Alt As or AZ mounts, as some people call them. And the reason why I call it lazy is because the setup to get started is minimum. And especially with the gear I'm going to show you because it's so automated that it doesn't require me to do a whole lot other than start capturing images. The alt as method allows me to totally skip the polar alignment. I don't have to worry about seeing the north part of the sky, much less polar star. I can set the scope anywhere I want. And if I've got trees, I got houses, I got lights, whatever in my way, I can move around anywhere and simply point it to where I need it to go, plate solve and start shooting. No polar alignment. All of that's just out the window. So what I'm going to show you today is how we're going to, what I use and how I set it up. And this is probably for alt as is my go-to uh, equipment for visual as well as astrophotography and actually I can combine visual and astrophotography at the same time on the same mount on the same telescope and I'm going to show you how I do that as well so let me get set up and we will start from there okay we're back so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the mount this is the tripod from ioptron it is called the uh, Light Rock. Um, it's an okay tripod. I actually kind of like it. It's um, it's a uh, the two inch, or I'm sorry, the 1.75, um, and it's quite stable for what I'm doing here. If the scope I'm the telescope I'm using and the mount, and, and the actual mount is Ioptron, and it's actually their oops AZ Mount Pro. Comes in this nice case. Pick it up and show it to you here. It comes all in this case, ready to go. So the mount itself is very light. It's um, the, the the specs is it takes up to 33 pounds on the primary side and 10 pounds on the secondary side. So it can actually hold two scopes at once or a larger scope with counterweights. Now, everything I use is 10 pounds or less as a telescope, so I don't even bother with counterweights, uh, honestly. Uh, and it's never had an issue. And this is what it looks like right here. And the uh, it contains its own battery. It has your handset and your RS-232 connection power to go in here to charge it and or run it on power while it's charging and then your power switch goes here the actual for holding your scope it's a vixen and lost mandy built into the same one which is very very nice and then a cradle for the hand controller and then over here is you have your counterweight bar that you can extend out to put counterweights on or, or to mount another second telescope now the way this actually levels and mounts is you have these three screws get this out of the way you have these three screws that, that go down to the to the the mount head or the tripod head and I put them about halfway and then you get three indentations on the mount that sits on here like this now it's not secured to anything yet because I have to take the middle rod push it up and start turning it in it, where it attaches to the, the mount itself. Now, leveling this, I've, some people say it's very difficult. I don't really find it difficult, but there's a certain process you gotta follow um, that does, it, if you don't follow it, you can be chasing the bubble all night um, to get it level. So what you have to do is you cannot tighten the center bolt all the way up because then you can never level these. You back it off a little bit. And what I typically do is, is, is what I'll do is I will tighten it up tight. Then I will take the legs 
and the bubble level that's on the mount itself there's a bubble level here on the side I will mount I will do the whole tripod till I get the bubble what looks like pretty level um, and then what I'll do is I'll lock in place I will undo this a little bit and then I will fine adjust with these so you got three of them 120 degrees apart I will adjust them until that bubble is in the middle there. And I've taken this, and, and they're all and they're all not equal. I, you know, I've heard a lot of different stories, but I have taken mine and I've put it on a granite table with this sitting on the granite table and see where that bubble resides on this mount. And it's actually very, very, very close. So I'm not worried about trying to put another level or anything like that. But for this demonstration, I'm not going to worry about, I worry about a whole lot of leveling. I just want to show you what, the, what I do. Now, the only clutch you have in this is the altitude. And this is your rod. We'll go ahead and pull it out. And this is your clutch. I'm going to turn this whole thing because there's no azimuth clutch. So this is your altitude clutch here. And what they do, depending on which package you buy, if you buy the, the com combo pack that they have, it comes with these little knobs you see here. These actually screw into the altitude clutch. Because one of the big complaints with the first generation of these was <clears throat> that happens a lot. The, um, that's why I do this in a house before I take it outside in the dark. The, um, without these knobs, this, this, or without this whole wheel is very difficult to get it to turn loose uh, if you get it really tight. And there's not, it's hard to grip it, and if it's dew points out there, it becomes really, really slippery. So they put these on, they added these, and it allows you to have a whole lot more control on getting it on and off. So it gives you a little bit of leverage. So anyway, with this loose, your altitude spins around, and then of course when you tighten it up. Now, there is no as with clutch. You're not going to move this by hand, ever. So it's only gonna move the hand controller uh, to, to move it around if you need to move it. So when you're outside, it doesn't really matter. Now for the purpose of the studio here, to show you certain things, I've got to move the whole tripod around to, 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 so you can see. Um, also in the case, you have the hand controller. You have the power cord for charging or running off of this if you need to. And of course the hand controller cable. So what you're going to do is you're going to connect the hand controller then to HBX, which is the hand controller, and it just resides like this. Now by itself, this whole thing, this whole thing is 12 pounds at the most, real light, easy to carry around. And what I like about this is when they say turn it on and go, they're not kidding. It does a self-calibration. It will spin around 360. It'll put the scope straight up and down. And you've got to let it finish its thing if you choose to let it. And then it will point to the brightest object in the sky. If the moon's up, it goes to the moon. This time of the year when Sirius is up, it goes to Sirius. And one of the things I found, because the GPS is on board, uh, this thing is extremely accurate. With the telescope I'm going to show you, that I'm going to have on here, every time it is put whatever the brightest object is with easily within the eyepiece field somewhere. And then it's just a matter of fine tuning it. And what it does is it puts it where it thinks it is. You look in the eyepiece and at that time it only gives you as with control, left or right. You move it into your eyepiece wherever it is you want to move it to. And then you hit enter. Then it tells you to align azimuth and altitude so you can fine tune it into your eyepiece and then you hit enter and it locks it in and says okay I'm synced 
And I have found that from just that, letting it do its own thing, letting it sync up to the object that, it's, that says it's the brightest, and I get it in the eyepiece where I want it, or the camera sensor, then when I go to the next object, regardless of how far away it is, it's always in my field of view. It's pretty darn accurate. Um, I've been simply amazed with this thing. The other thing is it's so quiet, you have to look at it to see if it's actually moving. You can't hear this thing. Maybe just a tiny bit of a chirp, but I mean, it's almost dead quiet. And so it's simply amazing. So that's all there is to set this up. No counterweights, no polar scope, none of that stuff. Just this all by itself, charged up and ready to go. Internal battery. Don't even have to have to worry about that. All right, so we'll put this out of the way. Now we'll talk about the scope. Now, for both visual and for astrophotography or EAA, this is one of my favorite setups. Now I have, I also have a William Optics 71 GT. I like that one a lot too, but I like the, this 80 millimeter uh, ED scope from Skywatcher. So this is the, this is the Evo Star. This is the Skywatcher Evo Star 80 ED. I really like this scope. And like I said, I love it for both visual and for astrophotography. It does a really good job. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook this one up to this. So again, I got to move around because I can't turn this thing. We're going to put it up here. This is a Dixon mount. Three. Put it up here. Okay, now the clutch is still loose. I want to turn this down. Make sure I miss that tripod leg and bring it back around like this. Okay, and we're going to tighten it up. Even though I'm, even though I'm very forward heavy, I'm going to be adding weight to it here very shortly. Now, one of the key things to when you're using an alt as uh, if you leave it set up like you do normally for decatorial, your knobs are going to be like this on your refractor instead of the parallel to the ground like you kind of used to when you first start out. Now they will always stay like this because the alt as never never flips the scope. If you want to turn it you got to loosen your rings and flip the scope around. But what I have found is that when I have to balance this thing, sometimes it pushes it so far that it runs into the actual shoe, the saddle itself. So I cannot, so I just leave it like this. It's not a big deal. It's not going to hurt anything. Um, it just, for some people, it feels very uncomfortable for some reason. Me, nah, I get used to anything. So what do I do with this? Where do I go from here? Again, remember I said I like to do visual and I like to do astronomy for astrophotography at the same time. So, my favorite device is the flip mirror. What this does is this nose piece fits into the telescope and then the camera fits back here. And then the eyepiece stays here. Now this eyepiece right now, I have it set. It's parafocal with the camera, which means it's in focus with the camera. Uh, and this is a 25 millimeter eyepiece. What this does is it allows me to flip the mirror down. And now I'm looking through the eyepiece, just like you would a diagonal. And then when I flip it up, the camera's looking at it. Now what's cool about this is at star parties. So this time of year, one of my favorite things to do at a star party is I will put this on the Orion Nebula because the Orion Nebula is very visible to the eye through an eyepiece. Um, and people will look at it and they'll see, you know, they'll go ooh and ah, you know, it's a gray cloud. But they can see it and they're like, oh, okay, that's cool. And then what will happen is I'll have my tablet sitting to the side connected to my uh, camera through the ASI Air Plus. 
I'll flip the mirror up, they'll look at the screen and go, oh my God, that's what I was looking at. And you see all the color, all the detail, the clouds, so forth and so on. So it's, it's a real crowd pleaser. And it really demonstrates the difference between visual observation and using sensors. Um, so many people I've known in the past, they see the Hubble stuff or the, or the news makes a big deal about some comet or this or whatever. And they run out and they buy these telescopes, these off the shelf telescopes, and they're just totally disappointed. And so, you, and even if they buy a more expensive scope and to look, they get disappointed because where's the color? Where's all the detail? You don't always get that unless you get really large aperture scopes, which costs big bucks. Um, so with a sensor, it's not as much about aperture as it is about integration time. So it's kind of a trade-off. I think a long time ago, somebody, somebody put out that if you have a camera in your scope, it's like increasing the aperture five times. I don't know if there's any real science behind that, but I've heard that several times. So what we're going to do is we're going to put this into the scope. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this cap off, my dust cap. We're going to put a two inch to one and a half inch or one quarter inch um, adapter. Stick that in there. Back this off. We're gonna stick this in here. Now, the other good thing about this flip mirror is the fact that what it allows me to do is when I don't use this, I have to put extenders in here to push the camera back to get the proper focal amount or focal length for rack and to rack this out. So I'm not racking it all the way to the extreme end to get it in focus. So this gives me that uh, added uh, distance at back, back focus for the camera. And then the camera, now it has a two inch adapter already built into it. I take the adapter that gives me down to one and a half. 1.25 I think it is, and then I stick it in here I'll take this about halfway out on the on the focuser and then I'll go back and rebalance it now when you go to rebalance this get your hand on that refractor because if you got it back heavy right now it's going to slam down and you could possibly hit your leg down here. And then you, you're going to have all kinds of misalignments going on and possible damage. So have your hands on that. Loosen it up. See, I'm back heavy. Okay? So, what we're going to do is keep our hands on it. I'm going to put my hand down here. We can hold the weight. I'm going to loosen these up. And I'm going to, just enough that I can slide it. Without it coming out, tighten one up, see where my balance is. Okay, it's still way back there. Scoot the board some more. Okay, a little better. Okay, now front heavy. Just barely. And some people like to leave it a little front heavy. Um, I don't, you know, it kind of depends on which direction you're pointing. There, we get equilibrium there, it's balanced. And it's going to shift a little bit depending on what your focal point does. If I go back, it's going to go back. If I go forward, it's going to go forward a little bit. But what that does is it, it even though your focus changes a little bit, it doesn't put stress on the motors. And you can actually stop, if once you reach focus, you can stop and you can rebalance it when it's in focus and then uh, you'll, be, you'll be fine. And then you tighten your clutch back down. And then other than hooking up the cables, we're good to go. Now if I use my ASI Air Plus, I have to mount it to the, to the tripod and I have to have a power source coming to it. So it, 
so it can do its thing while it's to this. Or if I choose to be really lazy and not worry about all of that, I just bring my laptop out, plug it straight into the camera, and that's all I need. That's it. Because the other cool thing about this is it will connect to your smartphone and it will talk directly to Sky Safari. And so I use my Sky Safari Pro. Once I have this aligned, I just touch the phone with what I want to see and it dries the scope there. And it's always in my sensor view or in my eyepiece view. And there's some fine tweaking you can do. Um, these flip mirrors, you have to kind of play with them when you first get it because it may be dead centered in a camera, but it's not dead centered in your eyepiece. So what I do is I tweak the mirror to, to flex the mirror with these adjustments to where I move it to the center or as close to the center as I can get in the eyepiece. If you're using a sensor, that's going to be your master. That's um, uh, Tune it to the, to the um, uh, camera. So um, when I first started up, I used this to find it but then I tune it to the camera and then I retune the eyepiece. But now that I've got it all set, they're always in sync with each other anyway. And that's it. That's all there is. I don't care where the North Star is. I don't care if I even see the north part of the sky at all. If I'm shooting to the south, to the east, to the west, I got good view. I don't care. I don't need to do polar alignment and I can still get fantastic photos. What's going to happen though is your objects are now going to have a twist to them so as you shoot, 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 the object's doing this. So what you have to do is you end up cropping. So you're not going to get those big, wide, expanse fields cleanly. You're going to end up cropping in to whatever object is that you really want to pull out of your photo. Um, if you do wide field with these, you can do that, but you're still going to see a little bit of that rotation. Not as much and it depends on where in the sky you're doing it. So if I'm doing up straight up east, I don't see much rotation. Straight down west, I don't see a lot of rotation. If I get up high as it comes across, it's going to rotate a lot. And um, what I tend to do is show you some of that. I'm going to show you the difference. I'll take, I'll find some things that are high in the sky, and I'll show you what it looks like. Because as it does a live stack, you can see the edges of the photos turning. Why it's keeping an object straight, it's um, and it's it's it, it's just the nature of the of the beast for for doing alt as. The other thing is the um, uh, the um, forgot what I forgot my train of thought. The other thing is that um, you want to stay away from high up. Kind of, kind of counters the whole idea about light pollution, shoot through less light by going up. And you can do that with a equatorial. Not so well with an at alt as. It'll do it, but you're going to have a lot of rotation in your photography. Um, so east, west, even south and north, uh, you know, you'll see some of it, depending on how, you know, exactly how close you are. So just keep that in mind. But it does work. It does work well. But that's my quick and dirty setup. Um, it works for me. This is my preferred setup. I can't say enough good things about this mount for Alt As because I mean it's highly accurate, it's quiet, it's simple, it's got its own battery. You know, if I want to just be just use my computer and Sharp Cap is what I uh, use on my computer, and I just want to use that in in this, I'm good to go. Now ZWO also has their own uh, live capture stacking app um, software for the computer. I haven't had as much success with it as I have with SharpCap, uh, and you know I really need to play with it more to to maybe maybe it's just me causing a problem. But this concludes this setup episode. The next time I get some clear nights and some time, I'm going to show you how this thing does its own. Um, orientation, how it does its own calibration. You'll get to see it in action. And then we'll take a look at some of the photos um, as we live capture them, uh, whether I'm using SharpCap or ZWO, either one. Now, for those of you that like to use the ASI Air, the big difference here is on the equatorial mounts. When you plug in the ZWO 
the ASI air into the mount so you can have mount control and do polar alignment, or not polar alignment, excuse me, to do plate solving. You normally plug it into the hand controller. Not on this. This, you're going to take it and you're going to plug that cable for scope uh, mount control into your RS-232 down here on the mount, not into your hand controller. That was a big difference between this and your typical uh, equatorial mounts. So, I hope you enjoyed this. I'm looking forward to getting out under the sky with this and showing you what it can do, showing you what it does. And, um, and I'm going to have it hooked up just like this. I'm going to have the eyepiece in here with the camera, and we're going to go out there and take a look at it. So, I will see you next time, under the stars, out there.